Good morning, folks. This is the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. Uh, it is May 4th. It's 9 a.m. This is our normal weekly agenda. We will begin with the roll call. Yes, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Bogue. Commissioner Gonzalez. Here. Commissioner McGowan. Here. Commissioner Resner. Here. Commissioner Robbins. Here. Mr. Chair, you Here. have four out of seven commissioners present today. Thank you very much. That is a quorum. Uh, good to see everybody. Um, we have a, a short agenda today, uh, commissioner comments, public comment, consent, and then some updates from KPK. Uh, so we'll start with commissioner comments. Are there any comments for the good of the cause? All right, seeing none, um, we now would move to public comment. Uh, would note for the record that we received a written comment from Janice Brown, um, which the commissioners have read, and we appreciate that. We also will hear from one person that signed up for public comment. Um, uh, there were three, but two removed their names. Um, the person that is left is Lewis Conrad. Is Mr. Conrad with us? Hello. Good morning, Mr. Conrad. We can hear you. Oh, nice. Um, can you see me? Okay. I think now you can see me. We can see you as well. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much for uh, accepting comments from uh, landowners. So I know I don't have much time, so I will jump right in. Just to make sure we know what we are talking about in terms of uh, site, we are the grant tank battery, one of 29 sites subject to COGCC orders. And the remediation number is 12158. And the tank battery is 300 feet southwest of a, a residential area. And it's also near a school, about 750 feet north of a school. And it's also 40 feet east of Gunning Hollow drainage, a perennial stream. So currently children walk within 165 feet and now uh, it's all fenced, but it's, it's excavation fence, orange, plastic. It's not the, the highest safety. So what I would like to tell you is that it took us like four years and we finally got approval to develop our, our land. So on top, of what we talked about, uh, the school, um, all the children at school. Now we will have permanent residents in about um, a year from now, because we got our okay to build 301 single family homes. So it means it's, it's going to be attracting a lot of families with kids who can walk to school, because we're right beside the legacy school in Frederick, Colorado. And um, I'm concerned now even more so about safety. So the reason that I talked to you today, it's not because we want KPK to leave our site because um, we have two oil wells that was uh, shut down by COGCC right now, but they are still within our, our master plan community. And we designed our streets around KPK. So whether KPK leaves, or not, it doesn't change anything. We don't have more lots to sell. We designed around them. So I'm not here because I want to build more lots. That's it, we're approved 301 uh, lots and KPK is welcome to stay um, as um, surface use uh, leasers. Now I'm here today because I'm afraid of uh, safety. And, uh, you know, as I was a kid and, and as you were all kids also, I'm sure you discovered everything that was to discover at your cabin uh, with your parents, that you're um, in your land, at your single family house. Kids, we explore. We tend to explore when we live there. So we did not have accidents yet with the kids from school, but they are bust in and out, um, you, you know, and they stay within the, the premises of the school per se. But when you are a full-time kid resident, You've got all the weekends and evenings and all these days off to explore. So um, that, that's why I'm, I'm here today. And it's, it's nothing to do with, with, with sales or so on, because we already have buyers for our lots, you know, the builders with the, the, the crisis, the USA needing more housing and so on. So th there's, a, there's a demand, but it's really for safety. So now I just want to let you know that 
we installed three and a half years ago. We discovered the, that the ground the water was contaminated. So that's a long time. Do you realize that I've, I've been communicating with KPK. We're talking right now about a monitor oil well that was installed October 1st, 2018. Boy, that's a, that's a long time to, 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 to solve this, uh, this challenge. So what's my point? My point is that for the sake of safety, after we have sold this lot, you know, just talking about it, I've got stomach cramps. Even if we sell out as a developer, if a kid gets hurt five years from now, I will be traumatized. So that's the first reason of my call, uh, my intervention. Second point, KPK, we have a relationship with them, believe it or not, that is not bad. They're very responsive for all other subjects expect, uh, except from decontamination of the tank battery. So uh, we asked them uh, different things. You know, they are surface uh, uh, use uh, tenants, so we need to communicate and work together. So, and they're very nice to us, and they, they respond uh, quickly for all the other subjects. So I was wondering if there would be a possibility that COGCC would organize, would organize with KPK and the landowners that are affected by this tank battery some type of um, virtual uh, conference like now where I would talk and say, how can we chip in money, uh, all of us, in order to, to help them? Uh, is it, what is really the challenge with KPK? How come they're, they're so responsive for other issues and they're absolutely not for decontamination? Is it a question of money? Uh, how can we work that out? So I just humbly uh, suggest uh, a type of, of uh, cordial meeting like this with all the owners, because our neighbor to the west is also affected by the tank battery. So it's not only us with our site. So if COGCC, KPK representatives, engineers, um, business managers, attorney, and also the other landowners could uh, get together, ultimately, you know, trying to find a, a, a solution where each party would, uh, would maybe chip in. Uh, maybe that would be uh, better before you know we go on uh, or the COGC, COGCC goes on with more legal uh, approach. You see what I mean with, with big fines. So that's it. That's my point. Thank you, Mr. Conrad. Um, given that we only have Mr. Conrad uh, for public comment, do commissioners have any questions? Mr. Conrad, I'd encourage you to um, stick around. We do have an update from KPK of its performance uh, coming up here very shortly, and you might uh, find uh, the information provided uh, in that uh, helpful. I do note that KPK's attorneys are listening in right now, so um, trying to encourage dialogue. Um, so stick around with us if, if you don't mind, and we'll get continued information. You bet I will, Mr. Robbins. It's a priority for me. Very good. Uh, Commissioner McGowan has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mr. Conrad, for coming in and talking to us today. Could you clarify for me, are you the developer or are you a, an, adjoin, an adjoined homeowner? Oh, we are the developer and land owner. And, and our land that we plan to develop into 301 single family homes, part of it uh, as uh, the tank farm. But the tank farm is our land basically, and KPK is a surface use tenant of us. Did I explain that right? Yes, thank you, that, that's, that helps me. And do you mind just explaining a little bit the conversations you've had to date about that specific site and cleanup and what response or not response you've gotten from KPK? I, I hear you saying on other issues that you feel are pretty responsive, but you're kind of stuck on this one. I'm just wondering what kind of what kind of communication there's been on this to date? Okay, so every time we talk about whatever communication we send by email for decontamination of the tank farm, we get a response that it's in progress. Trucks have been going. Uh, there's work to be done. And then we say no, because we, we have a, an environmental engineer who goes on a regular basis every three weeks and we can clearly see that uh, there's no progress. Then KPK says, look, we'll give you um, kind of a receipt 
uh, for uh, earth moving. I don't know the exact term right now, but basically a proof that, that some earth was removed. So there is, we have responses that says um, it's moving along. However, uh, three years and a half is too long for a job that normally should have taken five months. So that's the, the type of response uh, we get. So I feel that they want to decontaminate. They want to do something. Maybe it's a question of, of money, but that part I did not know. So that's it. So after a while, you know, I did not want to ruin my relationship with KPK, uh, constantly being on their back, because thanks to you, COGCC exists. So thanks to you all, I said I will stop uh, harassing them with, with email because COGCC have been doing such a great job. Now we learned recently that um, uh, you have been going there uh, monitoring the progress. So that's it. So does that respond? Yes, thank you. And I think that helps um, when we have discussions later on. I appreciate that. Thank you. Anything further? Great. Thanks again, Mr. Conrad. I encourage you to stick around uh, for um, further discussions with KPK today on these issues. Um, with that, uh, we will turn to consent agenda. Um, Commissioners, are there any questions with regard to the matters that are placed on consent? Seeing no questions, do we have a motion to approve consent? So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of consent signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Moving through our agenda, we are now to the quarterly update from KPK on its progress under the terms of the compliance plan entered in order number 1B-772, docket number 201-100261. Um, <clears throat> I believe that, so we have two KPK matters on the docket. We've got that one, and then we've got the set aside for the argument on penalties for KPK on the same docket number. Um, my preference is to take up the first, which is the quarterly update, and to hear from KPK first, followed by staff on the quarterly update. And then we would hear the argument on penalties. And I would uh, entertain that we hear from staff first, since it's staff's request there, and then KPK second. So if everyone's in agreement, we will take up the quarterly update and hear from KPK, its representatives, and its attorneys at this point. And if Ms. Uh, Morrow is able to bring to the table Mr. Jacobs and Mr. Watsman and others, um, that would be great. They are in, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Mr. Jacobs. I see and note that you are unmuted. Uh, do you need or desire to have any of your uh, fellow compadres available? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, commissioners. Um, joining me for this presentation are the Markham, Markham project manager, Ms. Jennifer Gallus. Needs to be elevated. Um, I see she's muted. Hopefully she's elevated to a panelist. Uh, also, my client's general counsel, Ross Watsman with KPK, um, may be called on to participate, so also should be elevated to panelists. If they already are, then uh, I can screen share and get started here momentarily. Uh, Ms. Amaro, can you confirm that their presence on the screen means that they're panelists and- They are panelists, Mr. Chair. Able? They just need to unmute. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to get started. You just get the screen share going. Can you see that? Uh, yes, we can. It now is in presentation mode. I think you're good to go. Very good. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, John Jacobs with Davis, Graham and Stubbs for KP Kaufman Company. Um, I'm tag teaming this presentation with 
Jennifer Gallus, our project manager from Marcom. Uh, very happy to be able to provide you with this, this update. Um, just briefly, the scope of this will cover the February 9th update that was never given um, and, and the circumstances of that very briefly, just to give you better context. The status of major plans required by the compliance plan agreement or CPA on February 9th, the status of those plans at present, other CPA required non-form submissions, deliverables and obligations will be reviewed. Project progress uh, will be reviewed both in summary charts, uh, color coded that Ms. Gallus will explain and selected project specific reviews for your benefit. And then uh, recent events since April 4th, when we met with staff and agreed to extend the tilling and forbearance provisions of the CPA, uh, communicating that to the chair and to uh, uh, Ms. Larson, the hearings manager. Uh, the February 9th uh, update, you may recall, was canceled. Um, we received a, a letter uh, containing conditions of approval or COAs on the GRIP, which had been submitted in revised form, including uh, staff comment on February 1st as required. Um, we were concerned that the COAs may unilaterally change uh, aspects of the GRIP that had been negotiated and agreed upon as part of the CPA. We sought the chair's assistance, as Chairman Robbins knows, under a specific provision for doing so regarding disputes about the GRIP that's contained in the CPA. The February 9th update as a result was canceled based on uh, that uh, reaching out for assistance to the chair. And our review uh, of the status prepared for February 9th is being provided here just to fill in the gap really, since we haven't really been in front of you regarding uh, our progress, our hard work, the final plans uh, since January 5th. We were intending to discuss those major plans with you on February 9th. Unfortunately, that was canceled. Um, here's the status of major plans as of the 9th. The GRIP had been submitted on February 1st as revised by us and, and was being implemented from day one, February 1 forward. A comprehensive waste management plan had been submitted in draft to staff in December, and we were waiting on comments from staff. The spill release reporting and training plan was the same uh, as status. It had been provided in December in draft, and we were awaiting a uh, written comment from staff as of February 9th. And then staff's written comments did ultimately arrive. Uh, they were received on March 8th by KPK and Marcom, approximately 10 weeks after we had submitted the draft plans in late December. The January monthly update, of course, uh, reflects this status for these major plans that were to be the subject of a February 9th update to this commission. Currently, the status of those plans is that the GRIP is deemed final with conditions of approval uh, issued on February 8th by letter uh, by staff, and, and that's by virtue of the chair's order of April 6th, resolving our objections to the COAs uh, the revised waste management plan was submitted incorporating those comments from staff received on March 8th. Um, there was a brief extension from April 1 to April 11 for medical reasons. Uh, appreciate that, that brief extension. We're still pending staff approval of the revised waste management plan. Uh, that's the same status really for the revised spill release reporting plan. We got those comments on March 8th. We submitted a revised plan on April 11th, and we're awaiting comment uh, or approval, rather, of the revised plan from staff. We also, um, based on concerns of both staff and KPK about spill reporting expressed in March, KPK requested a meeting with staff that was held on March 29th, and that was a helpful and constructive meeting. Um, Ms. Gallus can elaborate on that as appropriate time allowing later in our presentation. Uh, and then uh, flow line integrity evaluation has been prepared by our third party contractor Campo CPC, and that was submitted April 1st as required by the CPA and is also pending staff comment. Other required and non form submissions deliverables and obligations uh, monthly status reports for February, March and April have been submitted. A quarterly status report for the first quarter of 2022 was also submitted we've not obtained any written comment from staff on any of those reports, just by the way. 
Uh, the monthly project account statements for January, February, and March have been submitted. Uh, project account has been funded to the, the required minimum each month of $150,000, though. KPK's CPA expenditures have significantly exceeded this minimum funding, conservatively estimated by KPK at approximately $3 million since the hearing concluded on November 5th. Uh, Rule 526 applications were submitted on April 1st for five locations where we believe historic contamination has been documented and uh, those were recently set for hearing. We believe uh, most or all of them on July 5th, I believe. And then we met with staff on April 4th to discuss the tolling and forbearance provisions. No concerns were voiced by either party and we mutually agreed to extend those provisions another 75 days, in fact, scheduling the next meeting for June 15th. Uh, other administrative work performed in form submissions. I am going to turn this over to Ms. Gallus now, and she's gonna walk you through this and the, both the high level and some project specific progress on, on locations. Jennifer. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you for taking the time to hear this. Um, as part of the CPA um, and implementation, uh, we had a lot of ramping up to do so that we could get ourselves in a good position to perform this work. Um, and that involved uh, some administrative tasks um, as noted in this slide. Um, we uh, immediately developed a records management database for the project files as uh, record keeping is a requirement of the CPA and the GRIP. Um, we also developed an analytical database so that we can upload EDDs from the laboratory. Um, we also needed uh, to prepare some spreadsheets for each of the projects that are laid out in attachment A and in the GRIP. Um, and this was in order to uh, track any applicable COAs um, and CAs that may come through for each project so that we may address them properly. Over the course of the six months, we have filed 106 Form 27s. Um, we have closed two sites in that time. Um, we have also submitted 48 Form 19s, um, including closing out six of those uh, spill release forms. If we may go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, for some reason, oh, there we go. Just had to hit the <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Um, the next couple of slides um, are a, a couple of tables that we have put together. We have compiled every uh, project that is part of attachment A in the CPA um, and the GRIP as well. Um, this particular table is what was identified and approved in the GRIP as uh, setting the highest priority um, projects. And we've color coded them here just to kind of give a brief highlight of where each project is. Um, the orange indicates that we're currently performing a site investigation. Uh, yellow indicates that we're doing some excavation remediation um, and also related sampling. Um, the dark blue indicates that we're strictly in groundwater monitoring or that we need groundwater monitoring um, and, and that the soils are taken care of. The lighter blue color, the turquoise color, is that we have a combination of groundwater sampling and soil sampling occurring. Um, the purple line is that we are currently in administrative mode, um, so we just need to file some paperwork, whether that night, you know, may be requesting closure um, <clears throat> or if we need to do some, um, you know, form submissions and reporting. Um, the pink, which is not indicated on this slide, but you'll see later on in a, in a couple of slides later, is that that site needs to be evaluated to find out uh, the next steps. And the light green color is that we're performing data analysis on these particular sites um, and updating reporting and trying to figure out the next steps for them. This particular slide is uh, what was identified in the GRIP as a mid priority. And you can see that we have a lot of sites that are requiring additional excavation and sampling. Um, we do have a number of open excavations that we're focusing on um, first. So we want to make sure that those get taken care of as they were identified as a higher priority. Um, in this particular slide, we also have a number of orange sites that need to have some additional site investigation, whether that be um, additional soil borings or groundwater monitoring um, is yet to be determined. 
Um, and this slide indicates the sites that were identified in the GRIP as being a lower priority. Um, we do have a number of sites on here that are labeled as pink as they need evaluation. Um, so we have uh, uh, some data that needs to be an analyzed and, and try and figure out what the next steps might be for them so that we can proceed on these projects. Um, the next few slides, I'm going to go ahead and highlight a few of our higher priority um, projects and the current status and work that has been performed in the past six months. The first one is Martin J. Schaefer number two. This was the initial project that Marcom came onto prior even to the CPA being um, administered um, or approved rather. Um, and this is a high level project as uh, there was a number of um, hurdles that we needed to uh, get across. And there was also um, a large level of cooperation that was needed amongst multiple contractors as well as um, regulatory agencies. You may recall the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers was also involved on this project. Um, so we did need to have a high level of attention to this project. Um, there were soil impacts within um, the immediate area of the flow line that required an excavation. We also ended up doing some remediation in the wetland area. Um, there was sheen observed on the groundwater, so we do need to have a groundwater um, investigation launched, and we were actually supposed to be installing monitoring wells on this past Monday, two days ago, um, but due to weather conditions, we were unable to get the drilling rig to have access to those locations. Um, so that unfortunately has been delayed, but that will be implemented as soon as possible. It's a very high priority for us. Um, the ex excavation around the flow line has been um, completely backfilled at this point, as you can see in the picture on the lower right. Uh, except for the amount of topsoil that needs to be implemented for the reclamation plan. Um, and that will be implemented uh, as soon as that is approved by the COGCC. Uh, there was a requirement for us to do a soils analysis of the, the topsoil and the backfill soil and the laboratory results for those are currently pending. This is the Morgan A1 site. Uh, it, there is uh, an excavation here um, where we have been performing soil sampling. Um, this site is currently still in site investigation slash excavation remediation mode um, as we are continuing to excavate to remove the impacts as we are finding them. Um, we are currently looking at performing some soil borings to assist the delineation of this site so that we may expedite that excavation as, as um, we may see fit. This is the East Diver Consolidation site. Um, there was an excavation um, after uh, a backfill from the prior year due to the irrigation of the site. Um, the backfill started um, and then um, or sorry, the excavation started. And then while we had it open, we did get approval um, to apply an in-situ remediation through the application of a carbon treatment, which is indicated in the middle photo. That is all of the black in there is a carbon that we placed within the excavation. Um, and then we did receive approval to uh, backfill the excavation, which you can see on the lower right, we started and we got a, a, a good start on it. Unfortunately, there was another release that occurred at that site, um, which uh, then required some additional excavation. Um, and then once we get that entire site backfilled, we will perform additional site investigation. There's a driveway immediately next to this excavation um, where we're going to do some soil borings and then we will reinstall the monitoring wells as well. The H. Hewitt site is just up the road from the Stiber just to the east and it is in the same sort of situation. There was an excavation, which you can see on the lower left. We did apply a carbon treatment, which is indicated in the middle photo. This particular site, you can see a white powder. There is also an oxidizer component to that that was applied near the uh, irrigation ditch. And then the site was backfilled. Um, this site is completely backfilled as indicated in the lower right. And we uh, just need to reinstall some monitoring wells and continue groundwater monitoring. There was one well prior to the excavation and treatment that was above COGCC regulations. And the recent groundwater monitoring of that well has indicated that there was a drastic decrease in the contaminate, contaminants present, indicating that the in-situ treatment is not indeed working um, to our benefit. 
This site is a facility for AE2, and you'll see um, that this was a recent discovery of a historical um, impacts, and this was recently discovered in March. Um, there was an excavation that was open to remove them. There was actually a discovery of some asbestos containing material and some insulation wrapping the pipe, which did temporarily halt the work for health and safety purposes. But we did immediately put together a health and safety evaluation and um, put together a plan to address that safely so that we can continue the work. They did continue the excavation and then we were able to uh, collect confirmation soil samples last week and we are currently waiting those uh, results. If they are favorable, then we will request backfill for this site. Mr. Chair, I apologize uh, for interruption, but I believe Mr. Conrad is using the chat to advocate for his uh, personal interests and I'd, I'd like that to be directed to be deceased during our presentation. I don't believe it's this commission's practice to allow people to use the chat function for that purpose. They have public comment for that purpose. I, I, I tend to agree, um, although I also would believe that the commissioners would like to hear from your client relative to the issues raised by Mr. Conrad earlier. Absolutely. And I assume, I assume that's gonna happen. Absolutely, I'm, I'm more than happy to engage Mr. Conrad with the commission um, at the appropriate time, but if you could please uh, forego the chat until we conclude our presentation, I would appreciate that. That's fine. I uh, just FYI, I don't follow the chat as as a because it, it tends to get abused. So go ahead, Ms. Gallus. I appreciate your continuing forward. Thank you. Apologies for the interruption, Jennifer. Please continue. No worries. Next slide. Yes, please. Maybe. <laughs> I have no idea why this is not advancing. I apologize. Um, all I did was open the chat and look at it, and then we discussed it. So uh, I may need to unshare and then reshare and get to this particular slide. My apologies. don't know why this is not advancing. Um, well, halted the time for whatever it's worth. Yes, thank you. I, my apologies. Um, Get reset. Let me know. There we go. Let's try this again. There we go. There we are. <laughs> Um, this is the Music McClintock site. Um, we have performed excavation to remove these impacts and we did perform confirmation soil sampling again last week, which are currently awaiting results. And similar to the last project, if those results are favorable, we will re be requesting backfill of this project. This is a general overview of some of those sites that were laid out in color code. Um, this is a project progress of site investigations and, and uh, excavations and uh, associated sampling that uh, go along with it as far as uh, soils are concerned. Um, the grant tank battery, uh, we did go out and collect some additional soil samples on April 15th. We are awaiting those laboratory results. Um, and we do have plans to install additional monitoring wells on the north side of the road. Those need to be proposed as the locations on a Form 27 and approved by the COGCC, but it is uh, currently in the works. Um, the Eugene Doversberger site has uh, indicated that there are monitoring well impacts, excuse me, impacts in the monitoring well in the groundwater upgradient of the site. Um, and we will be proposing doing some soil borings to collect some soils data, which are currently a data gap for that site um, and continued groundwater monitoring. The list of the sites that's on the right are sites that have performed excavation over the last six months and we have collected soils 
um, as confirmations. Um, and they have indicated that further excavation is required with the exception of the Pan Am I-5 site at the bottom, I believe um, off the top of my head, I don't have the data in front of me. Um, but these particular sites are going to um, need some, some further excavation. This uh, slide indicates all of the sites that uh, have performed quarterly groundwater monitoring, which is being performed by Apex. Um, they are a contractor who has been performing the groundwater monitoring for these sites, um, and they have a lot of site history. Um, you'll note that the East Diver site, there is quarterly groundwater monitoring, but we also uh, collect biweekly domestic well sampling for the house that is immediately adjacent to the excavation. Um, and all of the domestic well results have been um, below laboratory detection limits and regulations um, indicating that the, the uh, impacts have not migrated over towards that residence. Um, continued groundwater monitoring will uh, be performed on all of these sites until we have received the appropriate four quarters of um, clean data so that we may request closure. There have been a couple of minor delays that we consider temporary impediments to our greater progress. Um, some of these were noted in the monthly updates, um, particularly that we had um, a uh, third party laboratory equipment breakdown. Um, there was a metals analysis part on um, uh, one of their machines that was uh, broken down, which required them to subcontract some of our lab analysis to another facility, which was drastically backed up um, on their um, analysis. And unfortunately that did delay our metals analysis for approximately two months. We submitted um, probably about a dozen different sites of soil samples in January, and we did not receive those results back from them until March. Um, and that was a significant delay in data. We did have a number of COVID absences um, for KPK personnel, which did delay some of the excavation and, and groundwork being performed, um, as well as some weather delays for snow. Um, and in general, we have been seeing some laboratory issues, and it's not entirely um, just the particular lab that we use. Um, we have used a number of um, different laboratories that are uh, experiencing the same problems in a longer turnaround times. They're just backed up with samples right now. Um, we did actually have um, one site's samples be lost, <clears throat> which required us to go out and resample those and resubmit and then need to wait for the turnaround time. Um, so those have uh, caused some, some minor delays in our, in our work. Thanks, Jennifer. I'm gonna resume. Um, I've got a blank in this screen and I do apologize. I thought I'd filled that in, um, but I know the number. So we've had some developments uh, since our April 4th meeting at which we agreed with staff to extend the tolling and forbearance agreements and indicated that in emails to Chair Robbins and hearings manager Larson. Uh, Ms. Stafford indicated that in her email. Um, staff has requested to, you know, as, as you know, because we'll be discussing this and arguing this point uh, later this morning, uh, made a request that the chair demand suspended penalties be imposed for three NOAB locations. That was submitted on April 11th. Um, staff's notice of termination of the forbearance provision in the compliance plan agreement was provided to us uh, just a week ago Friday. Um, that uh, notice was without specific reference to non-compliance and, and expressed some general frustration with progress and some allegations regarding spill reporting compliance concerns that we've addressed in, in a response to staff. We asked to meet with staff and asked them to reconsider the issuance of the notice. They respectfully declined. We've received nine NOABs in the last 36 to 48 hours. Um, I've tried to summarize those in a, in a chart that is 25 pages in length. Um, we've gotten issuance of numerous field inspection reports, 13 simultaneously, which I believe is unprecedented, uh, rather than rolling them out as they become available. Um, those started coming in Monday night after the 10 days notice had run. Uh, and scheduling of, of all five of our Rule 26 applications has occurred. I believe they're all to be heard on the July 5th. Maybe that's 
uh, July 5th and another date, but that also is um, uh, challenging for us, uh, still evaluating that, and we may wish to consider a request to stagger those hearings um, subject to the commission's approval and, and new hearing from staff on that as well. This to us signals staff's substantial abandonment of the agreement reached in the, in the CPA. And frankly, we, we think it's premature. Um, we've committed all available resources to performance of the work. And we believe that the CPA is working and should be given a chance to deliver the intended and expected benefits that we've worked so hard in the summer and fall to instill in that document, that important document. Uh, there are many significant first of their kind plans that were prepared and are being implemented. Measuring progress uh, in this effort at this time with so much front end work is a bit misleading, we think. This is intended to be a six month review, but the grip has only been in place for three months since February 1st. And of course, that too was revised uh, as of the chair's ruling on April 6th. So things keep changing and evolving and we're moving forward and making progress. There have been some impediments and setbacks that were beyond our control. We mentioned them to be factual, but not to, uh, you know, uh, make excuses and and the prospect of unabated staff enforcement on top of that, even as we're, we're building momentum in our implementation of these plans and work under the CPA is frankly quite daunting and it's not conducive to making better progress moving forward. We own this effort. We own this update where we welcome your questions on it. Um, that's why we're here and we're committed to implementation and improved progress based on the CPA framework of plans, reports, and the like. If staff can recommit to that foundational agreement as approved by this commission. Another quarter of work and reporting is warranted in our view for a true six month accounting of KPK's performance, including the upcoming flow line management report that is yet to be submitted. I believe that's due July 1st. So with that, we conclude our update uh, six month review. Um, Obviously, staff is going to respond, and then I would entertain commissioner questions as well. Stop screen share. Okay, uh, thank you for the quarterly update and the report. Um, I'm just one commissioner, but I'm wondering if it might make sense for us to hear from staff before we jump into questions, and then we can kind of get perspective from both sides as to how things are going, where things are, where things may be going, et cetera. Um, I saw some nodding of heads in the up and down direction. So I think I've got consent on that front. Uh, with that, we would hear from uh, AAG Stafford and or staff. Uh, you are recognized. And you are muted. <laughs> you know, I'm in my office for one of the first times and having uh, some technical issues here. So I appreciate your patience. Um, if it would be at all possible, based on um, some information presented uh, by KPK, would it, would it be possible for us to take just a, a five minute break or so for staff to um, collect some thoughts here? Mr. Chair, you're muted. Sure enough. Um, yeah, absolutely. Let's take five minutes. Um, let's take six minutes and come back at uh, 9.50. Also, if it would be appropriate, convenient, we intend to share the, the slides. We can send those to Ms. Larson and uh, Ms. Stafford here right now during this break, if you would like. That'd be great. Is, is six minutes uh, um, enough time, Ms. Stafford? Yes, that would be wonderful. Thank you very much. All right. Come back at 9.50. Thank you. It is 9.50. We've got the recording back up. Uh, Ms. Stafford, are you and your clients ready for presentation? Uh, thank you, Chair Robbins. Yes, we, we are ready now. I appreciate the, um, the, the time. Go ahead. Um, can you all see my screen? Um, good morning, commissioners. Uh, for the record, my name is Caitlin Stafford. 
and I'm an assistant attorney general and counsel to commission staff in this matter involving KP Kaufman Company Inc or KPK. Staff appreciates this opportunity to present to you today regarding staff's evaluation of KPK's progress under the compliance plan agreement um, or more, more colloquially known CPA. And staff plans to provide some helpful context as you consider each presentation um, you see today. To begin, I will provide some brief remarks on behalf of staff, including some general background information and an overview of the specific plans required by the CPA. And then I will turn it over to Nikki Graber, Northeast Environmental Protection Specialist for a more detailed and robust discussion of the facts on the ground. Now, commissioners, I think there are some important points to consider at the outset. Um, KPK conclu concluded its presentation with a question of staff's commitment to the CPA. KPK's concerns appear to center mostly on its worry <clears throat> that it can no longer use a CPA as a shield for other and ongoing serious compliance issues. Now the commission and its staff's obligation is to regulate the development and production of oil and gas in a matter that protects public health, safety, welfare, the environment and wildlife resources. Staff is very mindful of this when evaluating an operator's operations. Recall during the enforcement hearing, we heard KPK commit to this commission that it would do better. It would live up to its obligations as an operator in the state of Colorado. In which such, such promise comes great expectation. Staff expected to see meaningful changes, even six months into the CPA as we stand here today. What staff has instead seen is business as usual, a lack of commitment to the right the ship and make the necessary changes in operations. And the question becomes, how long must staff wait to see improvement? Another three months, another six months, a year? Or do we continue to raise our concerns and continue to document and discuss the troubling conditions on the ground and use the tools built into the CPA to seek compliance from KPK? Now, briefly, um, just as um, an overview here. I will provide, as my slide says, an overview and background. We will discuss um, some of the requirements of the compliance plan and an update on the statuses of those plans. Um, I think a lot of the, staff, the information staff is going to share with you today uh, generally lines up with um, what you heard from KPK with respect to status of plans. Um, we will also discuss plan implementation and progress at the attachment A projects. Um, and for that discussion, I will turn it over to Ms. Graver. But first, an overview. As you'll recall, um, what got us here to where we are today? Prior to the enforcement hearing between January 2019, 2019 excuse me, and April 2021, KPK reported just about 55 spills or releases. Now on April 21st, 2021, the director issued the Rule 901A order to KPK, which um, included um, various conclusions and required KPK to immediately shut in operations at 87 wells associated with 29 ongoing spill release and remediation projects. Um, I'd note that that order remains in effect to date. Uh, moving next to um, what you are all probably more intimately familiar with, which is the enforcement matter that was before you in August and, and September of this previous uh, fall. As you recall, KPK was found liable for 22 separate rule violations. The commission um, found KPK had engaged in a pattern of violations and assessed a $2.01 million penalty. The commission then authorized Chair Robbins to serve as hearing officer um, to uh, help staff and KPK negotiate a compliance plan to hopefully bring KPK back into compliance with the commission's rules and the act. Um, the compliance plan agreement became effective on November 5th, 2021, when it was approved by this commission. Um, it contains various compliance requirements and corrective action deadlines, many of which are um, generally summarized here for your reference. As you recall, um, staff and KPK came to the commission on January 5th to share an update on how things were going. Um, again, staff had expressed some concerns at that point and um, you know, the commission had asked for um, a, 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 I guess a previously unscheduled February update, which did not ultimately occur. <clears throat> I wanna speak a little bit about the plans that are required as part of the compliance plan agreement now. Um, as you'll see up here, we have the flow line system integrity evaluation and plan. 
Um, now, this evaluation was most recently submitted by KPK on April 1st, and staff continues to evaluate the submission. I'd note that the integrity plan is due on July 1st. Um, as part of the compliance plan agreement, there were also provisions dedicated uh, discussing the dedicated project account. And the, you know, the intent of this account was to ensure KPK was set, setting aside appropriate uh, monetary resources to devote to this compliance plan agreement projects listed on attachment A. Um, progress thus far, as, um, as part of the CPA, um, KPK is required to submit monthly detailed expenditures to the director to account for you know, what projects um, money is being spent on, the type of work that is being done. Um, I'd note that recent monthly spending indicates um, resources have been devoted to compliance plan agreement projects with a lot of um, the, uh, I guess I would characterize as non-technical work um, being paid to Kaufman Wall Services. Um, staff estimates about 40% of, 47% of expenditures went to Kaufman Wall Services in March and about 68% in February. And that would be to conduct um, uh, like the, the non-technical uh, work on the ground, um, which um, I think as you'll recall, staff felt um, continued to be appropriate under the compliance plan agreement subject to um, uh, prior notice. Um, now, I would like to point out that um, the monthly statements that have been submitted to date, um, many, uh, I would say the majority of them were were late, as you'll see on my slide here. Um, staff had to remind KPK that it was required to uh, send in these detailed account statements. Um, we received information that KPK was interested in having us review a draft so that we could ensure that we were receiving the right information, but that draft was never received as promised in January 2022. Um, and a further evaluation of KPK spending to date, uh, we see little evidence that $3 million has been spent as, as argued by uh, council in the previous presentation. Moving on to the GRIP. Um, I know this has been a, a high point of discussion. Um, there has been a lot of back and forth on, on the GRIP um, since we last uh, were before you in, on January 5th. Um, I'd note that uh, this slide sets forth a detailed timeline of events. Um, also noting that um, with respect to the GRIP, imp implementation began on February 1st, 2022. I think staff agrees with KPK that that was um, the date that, you know, the, the, um, uh, the, uh, the projects that are subject to the compliance plan should have been um, attacked based on information that was received in the GRIP. Um, I note that staff and KPK engaged in some long and drawn out back and forth about the conditions of approval that were um, ultimately applied. Um, and we, we ended up speaking to the chair to resolve that matter. Um, I don't think there's much more to say about that that hasn't already been said. Um, moving to the Comprehensive Waste Management Plan, as you'll see, this was due um, December 31st, 2021. Um, and in the draft plan, the draft plan had to um, include specific uh, details of how KPK would uh, characterize EMP waste streams and address required record keeping. Um, the initial plan was submitted on December 29th. And uh, with that plan, uh, KPK notified staff that it had begun training employees on that plan. Um, I'd note for context that staff agreed to hold comments on this waste management plan while KPK addressed the, um, the extensive comments they received on the GRIP. Um, so um, in an effort to sort of facil facilitate focus on one of the more important plans, um, staff agreed to, to wait and to um, hold its comments while we hopefully received a plan that was more in line with what we were looking to see. Um, this uh, very similar um, series of events with respect to the spill release reporting and training plan that was also submitted in December, 2021. And KPK again notified staff that it had begun training employees on spill release 
um, notification and its policy that it was developing. Um, I, I do agree with, with KPK that um, both of these amended plans were submitted on April 11th and they are awaiting um, feedback from staff currently on those, which staff intends to provide as soon as, as soon as possible. Now, overall progress. As you can see, um, or at least uh, the message I'd like to communicate today is staff is, is really seeing no improvement in operations or compliance. Uh, the time and effort that KPK has detailed in its presentation and that's putting forward um, is not translating into overall progress on the attachment A location. We have uh, several open excavations that pose environmental and public health and safety risks one of which you heard about in the public comment earlier today. Uh, there are locations where no sampling has been done. Impacts remain in situ on site. The extent of the impacts to soil and ground, groundwater remain unclear months after the initial spill. Environmental concerns persist as well as form non-compliance. Um, staff is very concerned that the waste management plan and the spill release plan specifically while KPK says they have been training their employees on these plans, staff is concerned these are not being followed. Um, you know, efforts have been made um, by staff to assist in correct reporting issues, um, specifically with applications of conditions of approval um, and, other, and other communications. Efforts to communicate on work in the field um, to understand uh, sampling that needs to be done to receive that notice, things of that nature. The biggest example that supports staff's um, greatest concern that this spill release and reporting training plan is not being implemented as, as KPK says, is that is the 16 spills and releases that have been discovered or reported since the effective date of the CPA so over the past six months, we have received um, information on 16, 16 spills. I'd note that staff has, uh, um, staff has put many resources into trying to solve these problems with KPK. Notably, staff has hired a third party contractor to assist in managing KPK submittals and projects to ensure that the attention is being made, to ensure that staff's commitment to the CPA is being realized. But as KPK points out in its presentation, of its high priority sites, only two appear to be receiving site investigations. And I think that that is a concerning fact for staff. Now, um, before I turn it over to Nikki, I just want to make two comments with respect to um, overall progress and, you know, based on on staff uh, assessment of the situation, we have taken the following steps. Um, following an April 4th meeting with KPK regarding the, the tolling and forbearance agreement, where I agree no changes were made, um, two additional spills were reported that week. Um, so on April 11th, 2022, staff also requested, um, made its request to the chair to demand penalties which I will discuss in um, the later uh, presentation time um, set today. But also on May 2nd, 2022, um, I, I admit I am unsure of um, KPK's council's uh, calculation of the NOAV totals. By my count, there were six NOAVs issued for, issued for certain locations and issues that fell under um, attachment A or the compliance plan agreement. And with the issuance of those NOAVs, the tolling agreement was, I agree, terminated. Um, and that action followed a 10 day notice in accordance with the CPA. Um, so my point here is that both staff and KPK built tools into the compliance plan agreement to help KPK achieve compliance. Hope, the staff had hoped that there would not become a point where we needed to pull those levers. But that point became a reality over the last month or so. And so that is why the why staff has chosen to take the actions it took. Now with um, my overview sort of of, you know, and not sort of, <laughs> with my overview of what staff is generally seeing across the board with respect to KPK's compliance with the CPA, I'd like to turn it over to um, Nikki Graber, environmental protection specialist who will talk more about 
pro, uh, CP, or the, excuse me, KPK's progress on the CPA, especially with respect to um, the conditions that we're seeing on the ground. And stop sharing. Thank you. I'm going to try to get my screen up real quick. All right, can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Nikki Graver. I'm a Northeast Environmental Protection Specialist and the KPK Project Manager. Prior to beginning, I would like to point out that all information contained within these slides is documented on the COGCC website and can be found under the spill or remediation files. To begin, I would like to discuss waste management and spill release reporting. I will finish with a discussion on attachment A progress. Ms. Stafford previously discussed this timeline on EMP waste management plan. So we'll go ahead and move on to what we're actually seeing in the field. But I would like to note that KPK notified staff that it had begun training its employees upon its initial submittals. Waste management in the form of stockpiles of oily waste remains a frequently utilized practice. Please note that oily waste or EMP waste is a defined term. This oily waste is hydrocarbon impacted soils excavated from the source area. We've seen improvements in the management of oily waste at some locations, as you can see on the left at the Music McClintock number five, where the stockpiled waste is properly, lab properly labeled and is stored on a liner behind adequately sized stormwater controls. However, we continue to see improperly managed waste at many locations. On the right is the UPRR 43 Pan Am I-5. It's an example of the most frequent areas of concerns we see. Here, the soil is not on a liner. liner. The silt fence is improperly installed and is sagging. There is no signage to indicate if it is clean overburden or EMP waste, and the straw wattle leaves a gap on the downslope side of the stockpile. There are also multiple locations where KPK has not provided complete waste manifests to verify proper disposal. While we have seen some improvements, we continue to see improperly installed and maintained best management practices, which actually cause larger land disturbance. Additionally, these, man these best management practices are then left without maintenance and become windblown trash. As you can see in the picture on the right, where the Mosier 1A silt fence has been blown into the excavation. Fencing installation and maintenance remains a field-wide problem and landowners continue to voice safety concerns to inspectors. On the left, you can see the Paul Hines number one, that is the fence that has not been maintained. Um, section 3.8 of the GRIP directly addressed these ongoing concerns and stated that site controls will be inspected and maintained regularly. However, staff isn't seeing evidence of this in the field. And then again, this is another timeline slide that we've already gone over. So I'll go ahead and move on to what we're seeing as far as implementation of this training. We continue to see reporting issues on recent spill reports. The errors in these submissions require staff to inspect each incident and to verify the actual site location and conditions with each submittal, as well as provide notification to local government designees who weren't contacted. There's also an indication of a lack of understanding of environmental rules. As an example, during the site inspections on April 25th, staff discovered that KPK was con conducting site closures without an approved form 27. Additionally, staff found that the produced water vault was being broken up and at the time of inspection, it appeared that KPK crews were in the process of burying it, which is no longer allowed per current COGCC rules. Additional issues at this location included spill reporting, fencing, stormwater, BMPs, trash, and waste management. Since the CPA was signed on November 5th, 2021, KPK has reported a total of 16 new spills. Of these, 11 were recent spills and five were reported as discovery of historic releases. One of the recent spills was a grade one gas leak, which was improperly reported. And then another one required an accident report, which had to be requested by staff. As of today, just one of the 16 new spills have been closed. COGCC inspectors have found two of these recent spills. This includes the Gillison 2A, which was discovered while inspecting the Gillison 1A, a location which is part of the 901A order. This video is from that inspection and I hope the sound comes through.
The inspector notified KPK of the active spill and crews responded quickly to control it. As part of the spill reporting, staff required KPK to provide a list of all wells producing at the time of the incident. KPK submitted an attachment that listed the Jillis in 1A. This well was required to be shut in per the 901A order. Due to this information, as well as multiple errors, missing documentation, and other inconsistencies, staff required clarification within seven days, which was February 18th. No additional documentation has been provided to date to confirm the production status of this well. Next, I'd like to provide an update on progress we made on sites covered by the 901A order and GRIP. We are still seeing issues with spill reporting as 12 spills currently remain open past their 90-day closures. As a reminder, spills are required by rule to be closed with either documentation showing full cleanup or transition to a remediation project within 90 days of the incident. Sites are, that are past the deadline include the soil spread field and the North Quebec tank battery, both of which have open remediation projects and the spill could easily be transitioned with proper documentation. Additionally, 22 remediations are delinquent on quarterly reporting. This does not include quarterly reports that were due in April. However, I would like to focus the rest of my presentation on actual site progress and what you would see if you were to visit these sites. The majority of the work conducted since the CPA was signed has centered around the H. Hewitt Consolidation, the East Diver, and the Martin J. Schaefer number two. At the Hewitt, the excavation, which was initiated in the fall of 2020, was completed to the county road in the north, the landowner's driveway in the west, and the new Brantner Irrigation Ditch to the south. Due to the ditches being turned on, KPK had to request emergency backfill and utilize in situ remedial techniques. On the left, you can see the final extent of excavation with a soil amendment applied. Full vertical and horizontal extensive impacts have not been defined to date and additional site investigation and remedial work will need to be proposed. Similar conditions are at the pres present at the Stiver. However, during backfill, KPK crews hit their own flow line and caused a second 55 barrel spill into the excavation. Work remains ongoing there. Remediation of many of these locations is contingent on irrigation being off. This makes between November 1st and May 1st a critical time frame. As the CPA was signed in November, staff expected to see progress on many of these locations. Two examples shown here are from the 901A order. On the left is the Eugene Doversberger number two, which aside from initial spill response, missed this access window eight, each year since 2018. The spill was within the new Brantner irrigation ditch and was discovered in December of 2018. The most recent form 27 from January 14th of this year indicates KPK will resume excavation activities in early 2022 when the irrigation is still turned off. On the right is the facility eight consolidation line which shares a landowner with both the Stiver and the Hewitt and was discovered in November of 2019. It is within the irrigation return for several fields and the subject of a recent complaint. No remedial work was completed at either location since the CPA was signed. Vertical and lateral extensive impact remain undefined and the irrigation ditches are now flowing. Other examples of lack of progress at sites in sensitive areas include the Yoxel Farms Manifold. The spill was discovered in July of 2020. The spill is within a high priority habitat buffer and adjacent to the Big Dry Creek and its surrounding wetlands. Only surface scraping has been conducted and significant impacts remain exposed to surface water and groundwater. Per the most recent Form 27, the monitoring well closest to the spill point has measurable free product, which is oil floating on groundwater. Further evidence that the site, the source has not been removed and continues to impact sensitive receptors, despite being listed as a high priority project within the grip. Vertical and lateral extent of soil impacts have not been defined and no excavation or additional borings have been proposed. The lack of project to these progress to these sites also directly impact livestock. This is the Hodrick number two, discovered in August of 2020. It is within agricultural pasture and near several residences. Per the most recent Form 27, no samples have been taken. Soil impacts remain in situ and the extent of soil and groundwater impacts have not been defined. Please note on the picture on the right, free, free product is visible on the groundwater. Investigation completion date is listed as of March 31st. 
there's no evidence that this has been conducted and remediation schedule has not been provided as required per rule. Our observations indicate that third-party equipment is rarely used and project account statements provided under the CPA also support that excavation activities are being conducted by Kaufman Well Services. In section five of the grip, KPK listed equipment dedicated to remedial work. Based on this list and measured excavation sizes for sites under the grip, staff calculated that it would take more than 300 days to simply backfill the open, open excavations relying on KPK equipment solely. This does not account for additional work to be done. So evidence that, not, that not enough equipment or crew is being dedicated to these projects is clear when reviewing proposed dates of work on the grip on pages 91 through 93. Here, KPK listed project specific schedules for 18 sites that were quote unquote, high priority and or currently undergoing site work. Now, based on the scope and scale of the site, work needing to be completed, we expected the grip would need to be fluid, that extensions would need to be discussed. However, of these proposed dates, we've seen a total of 59, that's 75%, missed with no communication. One reclamation plan requested an extension and that was granted twice. Of the 18 sites, only the Hewitt achieved the schedule proposed. Although as discussed previously, vertical and lateral extent of impacts remains undefined there. Here we see a map of all the KPK sites within the spindle field included under the 901A order, the grip and recent spills. These incidents are concentrated in areas of growth and development, and they're located next to sensitive receptors, such as shallow groundwater, rivers, wetlands, and high priority habitats. This even includes a bald eagle's nest buffer. They're within cropland and within neighborhoods. During the hearing, we all expected to see a shift in momentum to see pollution control, sites being remediated, and land use restored to property owners. However, we have only seen full closure at two grip locations. Meanwhile, there have been 16 newly reported spills with only one achieving closure. The compliance issues that led us to the CPA are still here. They're observed field-wide with marginal improvement in some areas, but are no closer to compliance. KPK continues to add spills and releases to its backlog of sites at a rate that far exceeds its ability to perform the required remediation. And that's the end of my presentation. I'm going to turn it back over to Ms. Stafford. Thank you, Ms. Stafford. Thank you, Ms. Graber, and thank you, Chair Robbins. Um, I'm gonna share my screen one more time. Can you all see that? Now I'd like to briefly close um, by showing you all some more recent um, photographic uh, evidence pictures from um, two of the sites KPK mentioned uh, specifically in its presentation. What you see right now is the Martin J. Schaefer site. On the left, you have the um, number two flow line spill and remediation. This is a picture that is from um, April 29th, 2022, which I believe is a more recent uh, picture that you received from then you received from, from KPK in their presentation. And on the right is the, the second spill reported in a um, fairly close location to the Schaefer, um, also called the Schaefer because it is the consolidated line. Um, and this picture is from April 29th, 2022. Moving next to the, the East Iber site, um, what you're seeing here is Site con conditions on site on April 5th, 2022. This is um, after the second reported spill um, into this particular remediation. Um, I believe KPK in their presentation presented you with a photo from March 31st, 2022, indicating that everything was going well. Um, and this is a more recent um, photograph. And this is um, another example of the East Iver site as it exists as of April 28th, 2022. I'd like you to pay particular note to the conditions on site as well as the um, closeness of the excavation to both the road and the house. I'm gonna um, stop sharing my screen now and just wrap up very briefly. Um, at the outset of my presentation, 
I discussed that it's the commission and the staff's obligation to regulate development and production of oil and gas in a manner that protects public health, safety, welfare, the environment and wildlife resources. What staff has seen from KPK over the last six months or so is not indicative of that commitment to protect public health, safety, welfare, the environment and wildlife resources. Staff remains concerned about the progress it is seeing under the CPA. And, um, and we're, <laughs> I'm at a loss for words, honestly, because I'm, I'm looking back at some of these pictures and they're just very, very jarring. Um, staff wanted to present you with a fuller picture of what it sees in the field when we go out and take a look at these sites, what the inspectors see on the ground. Ms. Graber is the project manager for the KBK um, uh, GRIP attachment A site. And these are the conditions that she encounters on a daily basis. We ask that you take this into consideration as you uh, decide what your next steps might be um, as you evaluate KPK's compliance under this compliance plan agreement. And with that, I'll, I'll end staff's presentation and we are available, uh, both Ms. Graber and I, to take questions and Director Murphy is also available should you choose to um, uh, seek input from her as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Stafford. Uh, <clears throat> at this point, I think we should recognize Mr. Jacobs for some response rebuttal to the presentation uh, as we're trying to get our hands around kind of where things stand at this point. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a few brief points in uh, rebuttal. Um, staffs expressed their skepticism about the expenditure of, of financial resources by KPK. Uh, apologies for any tardiness in our reports. Um, there was a misunderstanding about a draft report and comment on what kind of details staff wanted. We ended up submitting the report in draft without comment or as, as initially prepared without comment for the, the months thus far. We're in the process of preparing a report for April. It's just a few days into May. Um, we're happy to provide additional detail. We got a request for additional information from Mr. Farron. We're working to respond to that. Uh, Mr. Kaufman's uh, former bankruptcy trustee, chair of the finance committee for Denver Health. And, and as you know, we've been very forthcoming regarding the company's financial condition, even holding two executive sessions to review that confidential information. So we're happy to provide more detail on the estimated $3 million expended since the hearing concluded in early November last year. Um, I'd remind the commissioners that the waste and spill plans have not been approved. Um, with respect to spills, it was covered, as you recall, during our hearings through the summer and fall that a, a spill in and of itself is not a violation. Uh, 16 spills in the last six months. I expect if evaluated relative to other operators, maybe average or below average in terms of the number of facilities that we operate. So let's not take that out of context or in the abstract. Um, we obviously want to minimize spills and respond to them appropriately. We're preparing an, a flow line integrity management plan under the CPA that is intended to address that uh, in, in a more comprehensive and, and appropriate way. And we're working hard on that. Um, let's see, the uh, lack of complete waste manifests and some of the uh, pictures that were shown, I'm hearing this for the first time. Um, as I said, we, we've not gotten comment on our, our monthly and quarterly reports submitted. Um, and, and some of the things that Ms. Graber and, and Ms. Stafford have reported to you about I, I expect we're hearing for the first time. I'm not the person to determine that, but I'd like to follow up and provide this commission with some better information in response to this presentation, if that would be of help. Um, I would note the Jilson 2A is really not a, it's not a 901A order location. Obviously staff discovered it. We responded uh, promptly in, in addressing that daylighting of product at that facility and, and appreciate that fair characterization of our prompt response by uh, staff. Um, I guess with that, 
those are the high spots of what I got in my notes from the presentation. I, I do appreciate staff's perspective. I think we end up talking past each other a bit. And, and so um, having maybe shared our presentations ahead of time, we could have addressed some of these points more, more uh, specifically and, and completely for your benefit. But this is the way uh, the updates have, have been held. Okay. Um... Thanks both sides for the presentation. Uh, I want to sort of clarify a procedural issue before we get into questions and answers, if I could, from both sides. Um, and the, and the, so my understanding is today was the quarterly update, okay? And that we're kind of a little bit behind the times because of some issues. We originally tried to do this in April. Here we are, it's, it's, it's early May. Um, and I just want to make sure that, that both sides are in agreement that this is sort of the quarterly update as compared to the, I think it's the six month review, which was called for in section six, paragraph two on page 26 of the compliance plan. And in that section it says in May of 2022, we'll hold a review of KPK's performance under the compliance plan, et cetera, et cetera. Are, are you guys in agreement that that's not what we're doing? This is the quarterly update and that we're a little bit behind the time and we still potentially have before us the option of having kind of a six month review of kind of overall compliance? Commissioner, or Mr. Jenkins. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, that would have been my preference. But as of the fourth, following our meeting to extend the forbearance and tolling agreements with Ms. Stafford and her client, Mr. Farron, um, we agreed also to, at, at Ms. Stafford's suggestion, to combine, since we were looking at a, an early May date, to combine the next quarterly update. Um, this is really the, the one month later major plans update that was supposed to happen on February 9th, as I tried to make clear in my presentation, that we would combine that with the six month review because as it turned out, it was gonna happen in May and we had another obligation to have a six month review for the commission's benefit, as, as you just pointed out in, in the express provisions of the CPA. Um, that was when I thought we were not going to terminate forbearance and tolling agreements. A lot has happened in the interim. And I even raised the possibility and the question of, do we still consider this the six month review and the quarterly or next monthly following quarterly update that didn't occur in February? Uh, Ms. Stafford confirmed that, that that was her understanding. She emailed that to you and hearings manager Larson on April 4th. Man Hearings Manager Larson responded on April 11th, confirming that these matters, both updates, if you will, were scheduled for today. And, and that's why our presentation is entitled both update and six month review. Okay. And, and that was kind of why I went there, Mr. Jacobs, as I noted that your presentation entitled kind of both pieces. And I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page. Ms. Stafford, are you in agreement with that? Thank you, Chair Robbins. Yes, uh, we are in, a, in agreement on that. Um, the, the April 4th email that Mr. Jacobs references, um, I, I specifically requested that we um, combine the update and the compliance plan review hearing um, in an effort to uh, make things more efficient, honestly, for, for the commission, just understanding that much of the information we'd likely be discussing would would be repetitive if we sort of split it out. So um, it was a suggestion I made that I thought was fairly clear, but I now see um, there was some confusion following. And, and part of that's my fault that maybe I didn't read all my emails. I'm just trying to get a sense of kind of where we're at today. Uh, and again, um, I think that this uh, subparagraph two was a limitation on KPK from seeking relief until that time. And so, that's fine. Um, okay. So I, I, I see where we're at procedurally. Um, we've heard an awful lot. Uh, I now believe I'll turn it over to two commissioners for purposes of questions, clarifying questions, issues, et cetera. Commissioners, where do we start?
Commissioner McGowan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think this is for um, AAG Stafford or, or staff. I, um, I guess I'd like an assessment from staff about, I, I think what I'm hearing from the presentation and what's been submitted is that there's concern that perhaps there's not enough resources coming from KPK to keep up with all the responsibilities in the CPA and the GRIP. And I would like to know if you wanna expand on that or if, if I'm understanding that correctly. Thank you, uh, Commissioner McGowan. Um, yes, I'd, I'd like to have uh, Ms. Graber address, address that concern from staff's perspective. Thank you. Um, yes, you are understanding it correctly. We are concerned that we're seeing progress at one or two locations and we're seeing many other locations. Um, for example, the photo of the fence that was down at the Heinz, that site does not appear to have been touched or inspected um, in months. So our inspectors are constantly picking up fencing. We're not seeing equipment on location. We're not seeing enough trucks when there is equipment. The, excavator winds up idling for a significant amount of time because there's two, maybe three dump trucks and it's an hour round trip to the dump to take this EMP waste in. So yeah, we are, you are correct. Thank you. Could you, um, I, I feel like I've seen a lot of different numbers about how many spills and with, with different dates and I'm trying to parse out when we, you know, when we updated our rules, we, we required more rigorous reporting of spills. And some of them, um, I'm trying to think of the right way to say this. Some of them might be concerning from a protection standpoint, and some of them are maybe smaller and can be remediated pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm also trying to figure out, uh, I, I think based on that map that you showed with the, the color coding, mm -hmm. how many of the spills are related to current remediation sites that are sites that are within the, the grip and the the, the, the compliance agreement versus spills from sites that are not within uh, the grip or, or within the compliance order. Um, so let me pull up, I can show you, it's, it's hard to quantify because we have spills transitioning into remediations. Um, I'm gonna pull up my slide, one of my slides from previously, let me get this up, share. Can you see this? These yeah. are the 16 new spills um, since the compliance plan was signed. Um, and it is important to note that insufficient or incorrect information regarding the spill was present on each of these reports. So we're talking about, this is since the CPA, this is, we've seen 16 new. Um, and we can provide you these slides to look over a little closely later. And then, uh, um, let me see if I can pull up. It's, see, it goes, I do for, have, for example, oh. the Jilson is an existing site that we already knew there were issues. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, it's right. Um, so I'm, I, um, so the Jilson these, 1A is part of the 901A order. The Jilson uh, 2A is a second spill. Is separate. So there's 16 location. new spills, new, brand new spills, yes. new locations. Mm -hmm. And then, there are 29, 29901A and 44 compliance plan locations, if that helps like narrow it down. Okay. Um, um, curious to know also, I, I, I think what I'm also hearing from a staff's perspective is a concern about um, what's being said versus what we see on the ground. And some examples might be, we have a training plan, people are being trained, but then when we see what's happening on the ground, we don't see that happening in reality. And some examples might be um, regular inspections of sites, making sure that we're up to date on keeping our fencing up, checking mm -hmm. for spills. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I'm gonna go back to, um, a potential resource issue here and keep the mm -hmm. ability to keep up with all of its responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And we are uh, just as far as what we're seeing in paper and what we're seeing in the field, we're seeing um, those pages, let me find the number again, pages 91 through 93 of the GRIP where they're high priority sites, where they committed to putting their maximum amount of effort. And if you look at those, like I said, 75% of those deadlines have been missed. Thank you. Um, Ms. Graber, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the six complaints that have occurred. Um, and then also wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you're seeing at the Grant Tank Battery. I know we also had a uh, testimony, I think from Thornton about a site that KPK is responsible for. I'm wondering where we are with that. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could fill in some of those details. Commissioner McGowan, if I might just jump in first. Um, I just want to, you know, at least set the stage with these complaints. These are complaints that the agency receives from um, the general public. Um, they are in the middle of being investigated to uh, okay. the appropriate uh, response. Um, so I just want to be careful about getting too much in the details there. I, I understand. Thank you for thank you for saving me from myself. Um, Am I allowed to ask for an update on what's happening at the Grant Tank Battery location? No. I defer to your attorney on that one. <laughs> Where's my AAG? Here he is. Commissioner McGowan, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, the, the Grant Tank Battery is part of the compliance plan, so I don't see any issue with asking for an update on on that particular Great. and then, and, then, and this I guess would be to both parties. I, I would like an update on um, what's occurring there. Happy and to, the Thornton location, please. With the chair's approval, I'm happy to have Ms. Gallus speak to the grant tank battery briefly. I will hear from Ms. Gallus first and then we can hear from Ms. Graber. Very good. Jennifer. Yes, I personally um maybe a little fuzzy on the details on this one, so I apologize, but the uh, Grant Tank Battery has had some soils excavated, um, and we, uh, by we, I mean Marcom, just collected some soil samples uh, for confirmation after some excavation there, um, and we are awaiting those results. Um, to see if the excavation may be requested to be backfilled. Um, but, but there is a remaining uh, factor. Um, there is an applied COA, I believe, at that site to install additional monitoring wells as additional delineation is required for groundwater at that particular site. Um, there has been requested to put in um, an additional well on the other side, on the north side of the, the parkway there. Um, and that is uh, in the works to be proposed so that we can get that on the schedule so that we can additionally uh, delineate the groundwater. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Ms. Stafford or Ms. Graber? I concur with Ms. Gallus on what we've been seeing as far as paperwork. Um, however, we also should note that the last form 27 indicates ex excavation is ongoing at the location. We have, we have not seen an excavator there recently. Um, I think as recent as last summer was the last time we saw much work being done. Um, it has not had much sampling uh, aside from the quarterly groundwater reporting. And if I, if I may, uh, Chair Robinson, Commissioner McGowan, I'd like to note for the record that um, this this site was, as uh, AAG Davenport mentioned, part of the um, compliance plan agreement. Um, and I'd note that this site has had an open remediation since 2018. Thank you. Also, excuse me, um, Mr. Chair, if I may. I believe Commissioner McGowan also asked about the Thornton project. And uh, Ms. Gallus, if you're comfortable addressing that, I believe that's uh, the site that Ms. Yellico uh, made public comment on not long ago to the commission. We did uh, respond uh, as best we were able uh, regarding the discovery of that, how that contamination does not appear to be crude oil of, of the type that KPK produces. It was discovered during that water line project that's going through there. And it, it would appear to be uh, condensate from gas lines that also run through the area. But um, Jennifer, you have more specifics on that. Unfortunately, 
I'm not familiar. Um, if you can refresh, is there a name of this facility that might trigger my brain? <laughs> I'm I'm forgetting it for the moment as well, but I'd be happy to get more information to respond to your question, Commissioner. Or Ross, you just came on. Uh, I believe Ross does have the specifics, if you don't mind. Of course, yes. This is the Jennifer. This is the North Quebec uh, tank battery facility. It is the subject of a Rule 526 uh, application for responsible party status. If I, if I may, oh, um, sorry, inter sorry. <laughs> yeah. if I may interject there, yes, that that does uh, bring up some memory in my brain. Um, sorry, I have to keep a lot of sites straight. Um, I, I do believe that that site has been fingerprint tested um, to try and determine the source of that um, release. Thank you. And I guess um, it would only be fair to me to ask Kaufman, KPK, the same question I just asked staff, which is, um, Resource-wise, um, do you all feel that you're capable and able to keep up with all the responsibilities that are in the compliance agreement and the grip? It seems like things are still falling through the cracks, and I'm, you know, if you have any thoughts about that, I, I'd welcome some feedback. I will start by just saying that you know this is important feedback we're getting from staff. We haven't other than at this update and in January, really gotten feedback other than their unilateral actions. Um, we did have the one uh, spill release reporting training session on March 29th, which was instructive and productive. Um, and, and I think we'd welcome more of that. But as far as resources, the, the company is devoting more all the time. And I, I again, uh, would say that we're not shy about sharing our information so long as it can be maintained as confidential. And uh, we'll open our books and, and provide more detail to Mr. Perrin or your questions about the financial resources that are being committed to this project well in excess of the, the funding of the project account at $150,000 a month, which is really a form of financial assurance, if you will, under the, the CPA. Ross, anything to add on that? No, I think that that's good, John. I mean, we can get into uh, the, the resources allocated um, equipment as described in the, in the grip under the CPA. Um, there's a significant number of crews and, and equipment that are allocated towards these projects, um, and as directed by by Markov, by our third party uh, consultant. So, um, you know, everything that they have asked of us, we, we are devoting uh, resources as as uh, available. And to Ms. Graber's comment about uh, excavator idling for long periods between truck loads, you know, that's the first time hearing of that. And certainly we can evaluate the ability to get additional third party contractor haulers to, to keep excavations moving uh, more uh, reasonably forward. That's certainly our intent. Uh, I, I was not aware of that. And sorry, this is probably my last question. Why I'd like to hear what other conditions are thinking. Um, uh, is KPK using contractors outside of its own? So I know that there's a bunch of subsidiaries that do different kinds of oil and gas activities. And it appears to me from staff presentation, there's concern that if you're just using in-house, you you don't have enough dump trucks or people or whatever to keep up with the timelines in the grips, in the grip. So i um, wondering if you can address that, please. Ross, um, I'm aware that we, you know, uh, have work go to Kaufman Well Services where, where possible because we can do more at lower cost with our affiliate performing that work consistent with it being non-technical work under supervision by Marcom as required in the CTA. But when we need third-party help to, to get the work done, I know that we are contracting with third-party firms. Do you want to elaborate on that? No, that, that's absolutely correct. We are, are indeed working with some third party companies um, uh, for both excavation and, and trucking services. Other questions? Commissioner Gonzalez. Thanks, Chair. Um, I've got a question. I'll, I'll, I'll direct this first to staff, and then I'll direct it to KPK. It'll be the same question. but. Um, on the 16 new spill locations that, that were kind of updated to us today, um, 
you know, all have been flagged for incorrect or insufficient information, right? Kind of on that schedule, that matrix of, of where they are in, in terms of reporting, in terms of compliance. You know, this was a bit of a theme during our KPK enforcement hearing from which the, the grip was born. And I'm curious if you could share some more information on that and any communication during that process involving staff and KPK um, and, you know, any, any light you can shine on uh, improvements or continued, um, I guess, uh, deficiencies in that process. Um, yeah, I'll be happy to take that. Um, so with the new spills, um, the first discovery was 11.8. And um, that one, I guess I'll go broad picture as opposed to go one by one. That may be a little easier. So frequently, um, early on, we were seeing we didn't even have the correct lat long. We would go out to a site and nothing would be there. And so then we'd drive around and try to find the spill. And so we have a third party contractor now to visit these sites to ensure that we have the correct locations. Um, frequently, the only information we have is blue line spill or historic spill that has improved since our March 29th meeting where we get more information as blue line daylighted to surface, adjacent to county road or other information. Um, so we have seen some improvements. However, the most recent two that we received on 426 and 427 were both missing adequate information. Um, other issues we've seen is uh, has been required of, we don't see notification to the local governments. Um, I personally have made that notification on several spills and I'm trying to think, we're seeing missed 24 hour notifications. We had to have an extensive discussion with one where we, it was another one where we found the release or the leak, actually it was a leak and a take, so it was a spill. It's important to remember that there's a difference between a spill and a release. A spill is an active, ongoing, recent incident. A release is a historical discovery. So um, in that example, it was the UPRR 42 D2 tank. The spill was found by our inspector. We inspected the next day and um, it was as a follow-up and had several conversations, including a field inspection report and a factual information review with KPK in order to get the Form 19 initial. And then once we get these Form 19s, we go through and we put as COAs and comments, the issues we see. This, you know, we saw a lot of issues when the rules changed with other operators and it, this handled it really well. Comments, COAs, corrections, phone calls, et cetera, we managed to just gently guide the ship. We're not seeing a lot of improvements to our COAs. Um, in fact, many COAs are completely missed. For example, the Gillison 2A, where I asked for follow-up within seven days and haven't received additional information. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, that does. Thank you, Ms. Graber. Um, I appreciate that. In terms of the, of, the, of the information deficiencies, right, you know, you're kind of talking about these these general application, I guess these these general descriptions of flow line leak, you know, mm -hmm. or historic contamination, historic spill, whatever. You know, mm -hmm. what what kind of information are you expecting to go along with that? I mean, I assume that that the correct lat longs is probably the bare minimum. Um, you know, what what additional information um, would you have expected to see in that? So frequently with other operators, we'll see flow line release was discovered on Monday afternoon or a specific time even by a third party contractor or by a landowner. Uh, operator immediately came in, controlled the release, did surface scraping, excavations ongoing. It's, it's, a, it's a snapshot in time of what happened. And this gives us a chance to respond adequately. You know, it, We're gonna respond differently if um, a flow line daylighted in the middle of an agricultural pasture and it was just oil. We're gonna respond completely differently if a farmer hit a wellhead and misted oil all across a field adjacent to a residence creating a grade one gas leak. And so this allows us to scale our response. Does that, that answer? It, it does, thank you, Ms. Graber. Um, Mr. Jacobs, I'll, I'll turn it to you. What, what's KPK's thoughts on, on why uh, the information continues to be deficient? And again, you know, I don't know that the March 29th um, training should, should be the, 
you know, the, the trigger point here, I think that we provided some substantial feedback in our enforcement hearing last year um, in regards to the expectations for, for reporting, for compliance, for participation between the operator and staff. So, so what, what's KPK's take on it? Thank you, Mr. or Commissioner Gonzalez. Um, I, I can't speak specifically to uh, the, the spills on the list there other than the Marie Gerhardt. And, and I have the benefit of some information from the staffer, Jeff Rickard, who did respond, who did fill out the Form 19s and who adamantly uh, disagrees with the characterization that it was insufficient. He filled out a, an initial Form 19 on Sunday, April 3rd, within 24 hours. With all available information, he followed up the next day. He followed up on the 13th with another form. I have the document numbers. Um, and then he supplemented a 19 on, on April 22nd with updated root cause information that had been established. And so and this is a former staff inspector. He went through um, he, he went through training in December on the draft plan. He went through a voluntary session with, with staff on March 29th. Um, we did discover, and I'll turn this over to Ms. Gallus, that even trying to get clarity on staff's expectations about information and how to fill out the Form 19s more completely, that the screenshots for guidance that's available for, for these forms is not current. And, and there's confusion there that came out of that meeting. And so, you know, we're working hard to get better. We're expecting comment on the final spill release reporting plan. It has not been approved. Um, and yet we're, we're working hard to improve. And, and did we file some deficient forms? Yes. I wouldn't agree that all 16 of those sites um, had deficient forms. And the Murray Gerhardt is the one example that I can cite. But Jennifer, if you, you would elaborate perhaps on the, the continuum of draft, drafting the plan, training in December, the March meeting and where we are today, that would be great. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I think in addition to your points, um, I think that is a, it is important to note that we, uh, you know, submitted a draft plan in December. Um, you know, these spills have been reported of the 16, you know, only a few of them have happened since we performed this training on March 29th. Um, I do agree that there were some deficiencies but I do very highly agree that there's been a vast improvement and we are working very hard with staff to try and make sure that everything is reported correctly. Um, I would also um, like to note that, uh, you know, as Mr. Jake has pointed out that sometimes, you know, we do report available information, especially on an initial form 19 and not all information is available. We have, I have seen COAs where, you know, there is, you know, that we need to update the root cause. Well, that may not be initially available, um, but it is updated as it's found out through investigative purposes. Um, we are working on training our, our staff with MARCOM as well as KPK staff. Um, as indicated, uh, that spill release training plan is not yet finalized, but we have indicated within that revised plan that a training will reoccur. Um, and as Mr. Jacobs indicated, uh, one of the comments that we had received from staff on that plan was that our screenshots on how to fill out a form 19 were not updated and we pointed out that we took them from the guidance on the website. Um, so we actually went through and took new screenshots of the updated uh, forms online so that we could update our training and um, make sure that our staff are properly trained. Um, I think some of the information that has been disclosed regarding the accident reporting and open, or sorry, uh, spill reporting and open spills um, is that only one has been closed and I indicate that two have been. Um, we do have three more that are just waiting on analytical data and then will be requested to be closed um, in a matter of weeks. So, um, you know, and these are, these are spills, especially particularly the East Iber one where it was a human error. Uh, they did strike their own line. There was an immediate response. Everything went very smoothly for that cleanup. Um, and it is about a month out from that release. Um, and we are just waiting on the final analytical results and we can close that out. So that is, that is a vast improvement um, in, and shows that you know, things can work smoothly and move forward even when accidents occur. Um, it was also reported that um, an accident report on that release had to be requested of me. 
Um, I would like to point out that um, when that was requested of me, um, it was um, indicated to me that we weren't sure if one needed to be <laughs> provided. Um, so I did provide that within the hour of it being requested of me. Um, and there were no deficiencies other than, you know, updating supplemental information as it's available. So um, we have seen a, a very large improvement in the reporting that has occurred. Um, and I do not disagree that there were deficiencies in the past, but we are working very diligently to make sure that that is corrected. I, and, and, and I appreciate that. You know, I, I think that, that improvement is important for, for me. It's not uh, it's not where, you know, KPK was in terms of their train and their processes as the baseline. The baseline is what the rule says. Right. That's the compliance. So it's not how far you've come. It's how close you are to hitting that baseline. And so um, to, to me, just given the testimony I've heard from staff and including, you know, the answers to, to this question, it feels like there's still a long way to come. I would encourage you to continue to apply urgency to getting to that baseline because this is frustrating, at least as one commissioner, um, to, to hear this having gone through, you know, the multi days of hearing that we had and the feedback that we gave last year. Um, so that's a comment and, and I'll leave that there. Um, a question for, for KPK from Mr. Jacobs. Uh, what is, what is the frequency with which KPK visits all the sites listed on the CPA and, and on the GRIP? Um, first part of the question. Second part of the question is what's the frequency with which KPK visits the remainder of their well sites? I'm going to defer to Ms. Gallus on the first part of your question, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Jennifer? Um, as far as KPK doing site inspections or visiting their sites, um, I unfortunately cannot answer to that. Um, we do have our MARCOM personnel that are out in the field on a regular basis, whether we be performing sampling or, or checking up on sites. Um, and we do um, try and respond to those field inspections as they roll through. Um, I do know that KPK has additional personnel that, that is dedicated to that, um, but I, I unfortunately do not know specifics. I can speak partially to the second part of your question in that um, under our consent decree with EPA, we do have uh, real-time monitoring of our sites that are subject to that consent decree that reports data to our servers every 15 seconds, I believe, to ensure that we're not overpressuring tanks and, and we're monitoring our sites that way as far as in-person inspections by pumpers. These are generally low producing wells. Those may be less frequent than certain other operators with higher producing wells. But uh, if Mr. Watsman can fill in the blank there or, or add to that general uh, response, I'd, I'd welcome that. So yeah, our, our uh, pumpers go to the wells on a daily basis. Uh, they're assigned every day uh, to run a specific route. Um, so they're, they're out there monitoring uh, for both compliance and production issues. Um, and then our, our environmental team is uh, tasked with going to each site weekly. So they should, they should have eyes on every location uh, every week. So, so if I understand that correctly, Mr. Watsman, that, that every site that KPK operates is visited, has eyes on from a KPK employee at least once a week. Yes, sir. Um, if I might seek clarification of the question, Mr. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, uh, these are operating sites that you're talking about pumpers showing up at not necessarily a lower priority spill location for example is that a, a, an accurate clarification ross yes okay so i i just want to ensure that you know pumpers daily are at operating facilities we have a lot of facilities that are shut in and not operating and not producing yeah um, and go ahead mr jacobs I, I, I just wanted to make sure we were saying the same thing well, I think that's an appropriate clarification because I was considering um, producing and non-producing wells in that regard because it's not just, you know, the, the purpose of, of the of the eyes on um, at least drive by, you know, by, by an operator is not just to check on production to make sure that uh, that that production is occurring appropriately, but also for wells that are shut in, wells that have potential um, for, for for spills, for leakage, for release, that those have eyes on as well. And I'm curious, you know, for, for my sake, uh, really understanding the frequency of all sites being visited, you know, because it, it's concerning when we do hear that these reportings happen by third parties, that these reportings happen um, and, and are kind of news to KPK when, when it comes back to the operator. 
I hear you loud and clear, Mr. Commissioner. Um, in fact, in preparation for this presentation and discussions with Ms. Gallus, we discussed, you know, getting more frequent visits to our our attachment A locations, the, the mid and lower priority locations, as well as the highest priority locations, um, more frequently ensure that fencing is in place and, and up and, and protective and that uh, stormwater management practices are being followed. So um, we can do better. And uh, I think there's there's certainly a, a willingness to do better and, and to establish systems to get around more frequently in response to your concerns. Thank you for the for the answer, Mr. Jacobs. Uh, I've got one more question. I think in my notes that I'll um, that I'll ask. Uh, so, so I, I guess the request from KPK is is give us another quarter. You know, let it, let's get a full six months under the CPA under our belts and see where we are. And I'm curious, how much progress should we expect to occur in the next three months if that's the case? I'm going to put Ms. Gallus on the spot, and uh, certainly uh, hopeful that. We don't have any other laboratory issues. I, I know that the turnaround times are longer for everybody using lab services, but in light of what we can expect from laboratory turnarounds without, you know, breakdowns like we've experienced, um, can you estimate maybe a range low to high of, of, of closures that you, you reasonably expect to see us achieve in the next 90 days? Unfortunately, that's really difficult to measure um, as many of these sites require groundwater monitoring. Um, so, you know, progress is sort of subjective. Um, it's, it's hard to say if we're required to do groundwater monitoring for a year, then we're not going to be able to close right. out that site. That's so, an clarification. <laughs> and I would, would respectfully suggest that maybe you answer. Uh, for the sites that won't require groundwater monitoring. And then that, and groundwater monitoring, you know, four quarters for a year to show that groundwater impacts um, no longer exceed uh, table 915-1 values. Um, that sort of thing can be lengthy and prevent closure, but, it, but if you can get to closure for all steps except that remaining groundwater monitoring, could you estimate a range of, of sites that we should be targeting and and on it, I'm, I understand we're creating expectations here. That's why I'm giving you the range. Um, let's try to make it a, a range that you know we can we can satisfy. And Mr. Jacobs, I'll, I'll interrupt here just really quick. You know, it's not just about closure as the only measure of progress, right? It's about where you are in the schedule of compliance. And if compliance involves a one-year monitoring of groundwater, then and, and you're you're doing that, right? And you have achieved that and the monitoring is ongoing, then to me, that is on schedule with compliance. So it's not just about closure. I'm curious about progress. And I am asking for an expectation because I think that's important, you know, um, for, for understanding the, the realistic nature of, um, of how these operations are gonna occur going forward under the CPA and the GRIP. Yes, I do fully expect that we will be able to get Schaefer there very soon um, to just doing groundwater monitoring. We have closed out all of the soils uh, investigation. Um, so uh, that is a site that will go into that status very shortly. Um, East Diber is also getting very close. We will have groundwater monitoring and investigation. We have additional soil borings um, and potentially in situ remediation of additional soils. Um, that is also um, on track uh, to to, um, to to further that progress very shortly. Um, H. Hewitt, um, we have closed, we have completed all of the soils uh, there with the uh, exception of um, potentially monitoring across the street. We will be putting in some monitoring wells um, and monitor, uh, collecting soil samples during that investigation, which will indicate whether or not we need to do additional soils remediation. Um, so we do have a number of sites that are nearing, you know, we, we've gotten beyond that site investigation mode um, and getting into monitoring and um, maintenance um, type um, status updates, um, which will then, of course, uh, open up our availability to work on additional sites that are needing more attention. Um, so it, it's, uh, we are making progress. It's just a matter of how we measure that progress and, and, and what we consider progress. I might 
uh, add to Ms. Gallus' remarks that, um, and this goes back to the questions about the grant tank battery. Um, the sampling there is subsequent to removal of over 3,000 cubic yards of excavated contaminated soil that's been disposed, 3,000 barrels of impacted groundwater, and partial backfill was granted there, and we believe contamination has been fully removed, which is now undergoing the confirmatory sampling. So that's another site to add to those that came up today of concern to folks very close to getting uh, you know, into compliance and where we wanna be. Um, that's probably five that Jennifer and I just mentioned in response to your estimate. Um, if you want a range, um, I'd be happy to not just put Jennifer on the spot, but to get you a range of numbers from say five to 10 or, or something along those lines that we're comfortable with based on, uh, you know, putting our heads together and giving you a number and, and to allow you to then create that expectation come 90 days from now that we'll be able to tell you that we, we fell in that range or, or hopefully exceeded it. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not, I don't, I don't know how much that, that would help me. I think that, that some bounds around uh, a, a commitment or at least a memorialized intention um, would certainly be helpful and, and certainly be a, a, an opportunity for KPK to volunteer to, to put their feet to the fire in that regard. Um, so um, I'll leave it at that. that. That's the end of my questions for now. Thank you. Thank you. But if I might, um, Mr. Chair, could I just add a point on behalf of staff, please? Mm -hmm. um, to turn back to Commissioner Gonzalez's initial question about, um, you know, returning to, to sites and different um, remediation locations on, uh, you know, a whatever whatever basis um, or whatever schedule um, KPK has for doing that, I'd like to point you to Section three point eight of the GRIP, where KPK commits to specific site maintenance and actively maintaining these sites. And what staff is telling you here today is that they're seeing lack of progress. They're seeing sites become aging sites, meaning there's no clear indication progress has been made on the ground. And so I think that's a really important point to consider as we're talking about these commitments going forward. KPK has already made a commitment to address frequency of site inspections. Thank you for the clarification. Further questions at this time? Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I don't have any further questions. It was clear from the other commissioners' questions and the presentations um, uh, from this commissioner's standpoint answered my questions. Um, I do have potentially a procedural issue um, and, and, and a motion that I would like the commission to consider. Would this be an appropriate time to discuss that or do you want to? No, I think that's fine. I think we're through questions and we can take up whatever we believe is appropriate at this point. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I appreciate both parties' presentations today. Um, I think it gave me a pretty clear picture um, of what's going on regarding these particular um, issues that are being discussed. Um, I also think it's clear to this commissioner that even with all the chances that this operator has received to address their systematic deficiencies and failure to comply with the rules that govern oil and gas operations in the state of Colorado, I think there's still a real possibility that KPK fundamentally is either unwilling or unable to comply with the CPA um, uh, due to serious questions as to whether or not the compliance plan is still working and whether or not there is any substantial movement forwards towards compliance. I'd like to make a motion to hold a full commission hearing within 45 days to determine whether there is a global failure from KPK uh, to substantially comply with section four of the compliance plan and determine uh, appropriate actions according to Roman numeral seven, uh, paragraph five of the uh, CPA. We have a motion, do we have a second? Second. 
We have a motion and a second. Uh, do we have discussion on the motion? Commissioner Gonzalez? Yeah, thanks. Uh, Commissioner Mester, what, what, what's, what's this hearing gonna look like, I guess? Try, try and understand the, the, the objective and the kind of the question presented for it. Would entertain Commissioner Messner's thoughts on that as well as AAG Davenport's, just to sort of frame it here. And Messner, do you wanna go first or do you wanna let your AAG go first? Do you care? Doesn't matter to me. AAG Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, commissioners, Commissioner Messner, as I understand the motion, it's <clears throat> pursuant to section seven, paragraph five of the compliance plan, which is titled failure to comply with the plan and provides that if during the term of the plan, any of the following occur, the commission retains the right to terminate the plan, impose any remaining outstanding portions of the penalty amount, suspend KPK certificate of clearance or refuse to issue KPK new oil and gas development plans. Any of the following occur, subparagraph B, 5B is KPK fails to substantially comply with the requirements of section four of the plan where all the substantive requirements of the plan are found. <laughs> so um, obviously deferring to commissioners if you want to, to have a different procedure, in my view, the question presented by the, if the commission approves this motion and holds the hearing would be whether or not under section seven, subparagraph 5B, the initial question is, did KPK fail to substantially comply with the requirements of section four? The second question to the commission would then be, should the commission take any of the additional actions or consequences that paragraph five provides? If there was, if the commission files finds that KPK failed to substantially comply with the requirements of section seven. Um, I think the procedure of the hearing should be the commission receives evidence in the form of written or oral testimony, um, whether or not that the commission wants to provide an opportunity to, for parties to cross-examination or things like that. That is an option as well. And ultimately um, the commission deliberates and makes a decision. So I that's one possible option of a process of the hearing. There are other options, I believe, but that's my initial thoughts on the matter. Thank you, AAG Davenport. Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, AAG Davenport clearly um, articulated the intent of my motion. Um, and while I understand that a lot of the information that was provided by both parties today may be similar to information that may be provided um, in the aforementioned hearing, I do think uh, allowing parties some due process to develop um, arguments around this particular hearing would be appropriate rather than determining anything today. Commissioner Gonzalez and then Commissioner McGowan. Yeah, can I give a reminder on, on what the date was that the CPA was, was uh, finalized? Uh, Mr. Jacobs, um, yes. November, Stafford. 5th. November 5th. Yes, yeah, thank you. that final day of hearing, it was approved by this commission and signed and executed by the parties. I agree with Mr. Jacobs's characterization. Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I'm so, feels like we're at the six month mark. I was thinking that Commissioner Gonzalez was going to head toward let's let the six month mark happen and then check in and then decide if this motion would be appropriate at that point in time. But sounds like we're at the six month mark. So that was going to be my. My question, I mean, I seconded the motion because I, I think it warrants discussion. Um, and I, I have serious concerns about KPK's ability to, to meet expectations. And I'm also trying to like provide every avenue to like um, ensure like as much compliance assistance as we can and space to, to get there. 
but I also feel like, and I, and I'm sensing some, uh, you know, continued frustration from staff about KPK's ability to meet the expectations of the compliance agreement and the, the milestones in the grip. And so I, I'm, I feel a little bit differently than Commissioner Gonzalez or and then maybe Commissioner Gonzalez was not even going here. I don't wanna see five or six things that get completed. I wanna see compliance with the plan and the milestones and the requirements that are in the plan that we put together that shows KPK has the ability and the desire to be in compliance with our rules. And so I'm, I'm really struggling to figure out um, how many times do I hear we're trying, you know, the lab broke down, the, the, the whatever. There's a lot of, some of the stories or the excuses I, I understand are legitimate and some of them feel like um, KPK is really struggling to figure out how to come into compliance. And so I, I will tell you as this commissioner, I'm, I'm really trying to figure out how to, how to balance this out. I have concerns about the you know, environmental protection and public health protection during the interim while these things are happening and we continue to see spills. Also understanding that um, as a commission, we asked for more rigorous spill reporting. And I think that that's appropriate that we are seeing that reporting happening from KPK because I'm not sure that was happening to the level that we wanted to see it either. So um, once again, I'm, I'm debating with myself out loud so that folks can understand kind of what, what I'm struggling with, but I definitely, you know, I second to the motion because I think this warrants conversation to figure out, you know, how much time or how much shame on me, shame on you do we do before we're like, this isn't working. Something needs, something different needs to happen. Further discussion amongst commissioners? Commissioner Gonzalez? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, one of the, I, I you know, I, I don't know that it is or it isn't appropriate to, to, to have this hearing. I think it's certainly appropriate to consider having this hearing and, and I appreciate the motion. I, I'm, when I, when I think about this, I think, hey, is this gonna be, is this when we hear kind of the, the, the last chance, right? Or, or is there gonna be another, Hey, we we made a little bit more progress, a little bit more progress, and we keep on, you know, kicking this can down every forty-five days or so, or whatever that looks like coming out of that next hearing. I really think that I'd like for that hearing to be robust enough to, I guess, give KPK the best opportunity to come into compliance, um, knowing that that it might be, might be the last opportunity. You know, I, I don't know where we're going to go after that hearing. Um, but it, but it seems to me just based on, on how this has gone down and what came out of the, you know, the, the prior hearing last year, um, the, the, the progress or lack of progress we're hearing today, um, I don't know if 45 days is the appropriate amount of time to really have that discussion. Um, I don't know what is, but I would open that to, to, to other thoughts from commissioners and maybe I'll start with, with you, Commissioner Messner, on, on, on your thoughts on that time frame. Um, that, that's, you know, the, the hearing itself, I, I think is, um, is something that, that I'm in favor of. I think for me, I'm struggling with the time frame to, to, really, to really dial in when, when the pivotal, pivotal point should be. Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I mean, I think it's pretty well laid out in the CPA that there's a six month evaluation that needs to occur with this particular operator in this particular situation. And I think both parties have determined that this is the day that that summary, uh, that analysis is being done. Certainly from uh, this commissioner's standpoint, I've heard enough in this analysis for me to question whether or not KPK is willing or able to comply with the CPA. I've not seen any substantial progress um, as far as changing the culture of KPK in complying with the rules of the COGCC. And I think that 45 days is appropriate to, you know, not continue extending these, this thing out indefinitely. I think there's real public health safety environment issues associated with the sites uh, associated with this CPA. I think that there's um, a, um, you know, a, a, a necessary, um, 
there's a necessary step that needs to be taken to ensure that we are meeting the obligations of the act uh, in this particular situation, and we need to do it in a, um, you know, in, in a manner that doesn't drag these things out indefinitely. And so I think that for me, I think the the CPA clearly negotiated out a six month compliance check. And I think we're having that six month compliant check. And the reason that I'm willing to give it 45 days is to just allow for parties to be able to develop their arguments for a formal hearing on the matter. Very good. Um, thank you, Commissioner Messner for the uh, perspective. Uh, I'm gonna be uh, voting in favor of the hearing uh, I believe that we've had the six month check in. Um, I believe we've heard from staff and we've heard from KPK with regard to compliance. I think the due process uh, from the compliance agreement uh, requires us to set a formal hearing to determine whether the section four uh, action items are indeed complied with. I think 45 days makes sense. Uh, if there's no further discussion, I'm ready to call for uh, a vote on the motion. Looking around to see if there's any further discussion. Commissioner McGowan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Could I just get confirmation of what that date would be and what commission hearing date that, that would be? Uh, I believe we would be looking at something in mid-June. Um, Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to clarify, I think I said in my motion, you know, within 45 days, right? So not right at 45 days, but to create some flexibility with parties and um, and with commission to ensure that something lands in there. Um, so I, I wasn't saying specifically 45 days. And a lot of times we can have a not date certain and then let the hearing officer work with the parties to find a hearing date that works with our schedules and that works with the parties as well. Um, I'd be comfortable leaving it at that. Um, uh, and I think the motion sort of contemplates that as well. I, thank you, Mr. Sir. I, I just want to make sure that we do this before the end of June. Anything further? I'm looking at AAG Davenport to see if we need anything further before we vote. No, not for the motion. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I do think that, um, you know, if the motion is no further than 45 days out, then it would require some additional discussion with the parties offline about scheduling that the specific date for that hearing. And that could be done, um, you know, I think through um, hearings manager or some other person on staff to facilitate that discussion. Okay. All right then, um, seeing no further discussion, uh, we will entertain the motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those uh, opposed signify by saying opposed. Okay, so the motion carries. Um, at this point, I question whether we need to go into the argument on penalties at this point, given the fact that we've now identified that we're going to have a full-blown hearing on full-blown compliance. Um, it seems to me that maybe that could be taken up as part of the other the, the motion that has now passed. Uh, AAG Davenport, uh, do you have any thoughts about that? I just want, I think, a, a point that ultimately the compliance plan does for NOAB specific and, and other matters that KPK must comply with does put it to the chair to make a decision. Um, I think given the motion in regard to sort of a global compliance plan that it is acceptable to delay that decision until the hearing takes place at the commission. But we haven't quite scheduled, but will happen in the, in the near term. Then 
being the chair and the hearing officer, I'm going to uh, uh, go ahead and, and, and rule that we'll, we'll delay that issue and we'll allow the full commission to take the that matter up at the global compliance plan hearing that we've just indicated we want to see occur. Chair, if I if I may make a request um, based on the penalty argument, um, staff did not have the opportunity to file a reply, a written submission. Um, I'm wondering if now that this argument will be postponed, if we could be given that opportunity to file a written reply to KPK's response for the record. Um, that is fine with me. Um, I, I, you know, I think what we can do is, is we can take this matter up in terms of scheduling and, and in terms of, you know, how we're going to hold um, a hearing on this matter in terms of evidence and, and written briefs, et cetera, um, you know, offline uh, outside of the full-blown commission. Okay. All right. Um, with that, uh, we are done with the matters that were agendized for ourselves today. I will give both Mr. Jacobs and Ms. Stafford an opportunity for any, any further procedural issues so that we're set to, to go forward uh, based upon the motion that carried. Mr. Jacobs? Uh, we'll be prepared for hearing and uh, we'll, we'll engage with the hearing officer and opposing counsel to get ready to, so that you can hear the facts and, and make a, a, a reasoned decision. Um, I'm, I'm certainly disappointed in the motion. Uh, felt like we haven't really given this, this CPA a chance for success, a full chance, a full six months post grip implementation. And that's what we were asking for. Uh, and, and you decided otherwise, so we'll, we'll move forward. Okay, Mr. Ms. Stafford, anything else? Um, just that I, that I echo Mr. Jacobs' thoughts with respect to working with the hearing officer and um, he and his client to um, figuring out scheduling for this matter. Um, I don't know if this is a uh, proper time to, to address this, but um, I just wanted to ask the question based on the language in paragraph five. Um, I believe paragraph five of um, section seven, six, no, seven, I'm sorry, specifies that KPK bears the burden of demonstrating compliance with the compliance plan. So I just want to ensure that um, each party is aware of how that will go procedurally. And I'm sure that's something we can work out with the hearing officer, but at least wanted to make sure that was on the record. Okay, um, before we adjourn, I'd like to take five minutes. Um, I have a question for my AAG that I'd like to ask. Um, so let's take a break and reconvene at 1134. Okay, okay uh, we are back live here. Um, thank you for that quick uh, break. Um, so I, I wanted just to clarify for the record um, the position that, that I plan on taking. I was assigned as hearing officer to negotiate the compliance plan itself. Um, that has, and then to sort of be available if there were issues between the parties relevant to the compliance plan. I will plan on not serving as hearing officer to set up the procedural matters that need to be set up for purposes of this hearing that we've now indicated we're gonna have. I also will plan on participating as a commissioner at that hearing, because I don't think that my previous uh, position as being the hearing officer to get to a compliance plan forecloses my ability to serve as a seated uh, uh, commissioner for purposes of determining um, moving forward. Um, I will allow both parties to um, speak ever so briefly about my plans uh, to determine if you are um, okay with that or not. Uh, Mr. Jacobs, I'll allow you to go first. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I appreciate you addressing that procedural point. 
I, I do wish to confer with my client, but um, subject to that, I don't believe we would have any objection to proceeding in that manner as you've described. Okay, and I'll give you a chance to talk with your client if you want to raise that. If, you know, if any issues arise, um, you and I and Ms. Stafford can address those offline as we have been doing. Uh, Ms. Stafford, um, from your client's perspective, noting you haven't had a chance to talk to them, do you have initial thoughts about the position I'm taking? Um, no initial thoughts, Chair Robbins. Thank you uh, for asking. Um, I think I, you know, echo Mr. Jagus in that. Um, yes, we would. I would like to confer with my client, but um, I am happy to raise this if we think it's an issue going forward. Okay. Um, anything from my fellow commissioners about the position I'm taking? Okay. Seeing none, um, I believe we are at the conclusion of the agenda, agendized matters for today. Uh, I think we are looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. <laughs> motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Great. We're adjourned. Um, we'll see everybody at our next scheduled meeting.